After the second Block 2 starship exploded in the sky, a question suddenly popped into my mind. Looking at the earlier designs of Starship, I noticed something crucial was missing. A feature that's standard on most crewed spacecraft. An abort system. Why doesn't it have one? Does Starship even need an abort system at all? First, what's an abort system? The launch abort system is a safety system built into the space capsule that can save the crew in case something goes horribly wrong during launch, like if there's a threat of an explosion. If an emergency happens, the launch abort system can quickly launch the capsule away from the rocket, sending the crew to safety. It works automatically by detecting rocket failures, but the crew commander can also activate it manually if needed. Abort motors can blast out a ton of thrust in a split second, easily hitting 10 Gs or more. It's not a fun experience, frankly, quite horrible, kind of like being hit by a truck for a few seconds. But hey, at least your chances of surviving to tell the tales are higher. There are several launch escape systems, but the most common remains the solid-fueled rocket, typically mounted above the capsule on a launch tower. This system provides a powerful burst of thrust for a short duration, propelling the capsule to a safe distance from the launch vehicle. Once separated, the capsule's parachute recovery system can then be deployed for a safe landing, either on land or in water. The escape tower and rocket are jettisoned at a point during the flight when they are either no longer necessary or cannot effectively abort the mission. These systems have been used on the Mercury, Apollo, Soyuz, and Shenzhou capsules. However, today's popular spacecraft, such as SpaceX's Crew Dragon, Blue Origin's New Shepard, and even Starliner, all utilize a different type of launch escape. Instead of the traditional escape tower, these spacecraft rely on thrusters integrated into the capsule or its detachable service module to perform the same function of aborting a launch in case of emergency. Another system involves crew seats that eject, similar to those used in military aircraft, with each crew member descending to Earth using an individual parachute. These systems are only effective within a limited range of altitudes and speeds, though I won't delve into the details of this system here. Before addressing the question of why Starship doesn't have an abort system, let's first explore what would happen if it were equipped with one. Starship won't be able to use an escape tower like the Apollo and other spacecraft of the era. It's simply too big and heavy for that method. Instead, it will use an integrated thruster, which also gives SpaceX an advantage because of its experience with the Crew Dragon. The Crew Dragon launch abort system is a critical safety feature designed to swiftly propel the SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft away from a failing launch vehicle, ensuring the safety of its crew. It is equipped with eight Super Draco engines, each capable of generating 71 kilonewtons of thrust, providing the necessary power for a rapid and effective abort in the event of an emergency. The system operates in various modes, allowing it to handle different stages of flight. These include a pad abort, to be used if a failure occurs during launch preparation, an in-flight abort, to be activated if an issue arises while ascending, and a late-flight abort that can guide the spacecraft into a lower-than-planned orbit. Applied to Starship, the ship will probably use its own Raptor engines as an emergency escape system. In the event of an explosion at launch, if the explosion occurs on the upper stage, then we screw. There is no way to save it. If the explosion occurs on the Super Heavy, the ship will fire all six Raptor engines at maximum power to get it as far away from the explosion as possible. Now, here's the thing. When I say it will launch away from the explosion as fast as possible, I mean these engines will help the ship slowly fly away at best. Not just the Raptor engine, but this is a common characteristic of liquid engines in general. They are very safe because they are easy to control, but they need a while to really reach maximum speed. This is why most traditional abort systems use solid propellant motors. They can generate thrust at a fraction of the cost and for relatively low cost. Another advantage of solid fuel rockets is that they can remain in storage for long periods without significant degradation of the propellant. This makes them ideal for emergency situations where readiness and reliability are crucial, as they can be quickly activated when needed without concerns about performance loss over time. If there is any downside, it is that once ignited, they cannot be shut off.
This is because the motor contains all the components necessary for combustion within the chamber, making it impossible to stop the reaction once it begins. But wait, doesn't Super Draco use liquid fuel? Why can it get away with it? Well, they actually used a type of liquid-fueled rocket engines that use a system similar to reaction control systems, which offer fast and reliable ignition. This system is known as a pressure-fed engine, a class of rocket engine design where a separate gas supply, typically helium, is used to pressurize the propellant tanks, forcing the fuel and oxidizer into the combustion chamber. To ensure proper flow, the pressure in the tanks must be higher than that in the combustion chamber. Pressure-fed engines feature simple plumbing and eliminate the need for complex and sometimes unreliable turbo pumps. The typical startup procedure begins by opening a valve, often a pyrotechnic device, to allow the pressurizing gas to flow through check valves into the propellant tanks. Once this is done, the propellant valves in the engine are opened. If the fuel and oxidizer are hypergolic, they ignite spontaneously upon contact. If they are non-hypergolic, an igniter is required. Multiple burns can be performed simply by opening and closing the propellant valves as needed. Additionally, if the pressurization system includes activating valves, they can be operated electrically or by gas pressure, often controlled by smaller electrically operated valves. Another reason Crew Dragon uses this type of engine is that depending on the mission profile, it will dock with the ISS and stay there for quite a while. This means it will be exposed to constant temperature changes. Under these environmental conditions, a solid fuel engine has the potential to unexpectedly explode. We really don't want to accidentally retire the International Space Station early, especially when there are still people on board. Now, back to Starship, if we are going to integrate pressure-fed engines into the launch abort system for the ship, there will be a huge number of modifications that need to be done. Otherwise, we can only cross our fingers and hope that nothing goes wrong at this stage. Fortunately, Super Heavy has proven itself to be a reliable system so far, with no explosions occurring on the launch pad. The only damage it caused was on its first flight when SpaceX did not have a flame diverter system installed. That is abort while on the pad. What about in-flight abort? Is there a method that can be used while we are in flight? It will depend on how high we are. In the Space Shuttle project, there was once a method where the crew literally jumped out of the ship at 60,000 feet above sea level. Provided nothing had gone catastrophically wrong and the space shuttle could still be manoeuvred into a stable glide, the astronauts, who had only minutes earlier been en route to orbit, would now prepare for a dramatic ocean descent, readying themselves to parachute into the waters below. As the orbiter made its descent, the commander would engage the autopilot and instruct the astronaut closest to the outer hatch, positioned on the mid-deck below, to begin depressurizing the cabin and jettisoning the hatch. Once at the hatch, the astronaut would pull a handle to deploy a nine-foot telescoping pole into the rushing wind. They would then attach one of the seven lanyards from the pole to a metal ring on their parachute harness. One by one, the astronauts would kneel in the hatch and leap into the equivalent of a 230 mile per hour wind hurtling toward the ocean. However, if Starship is at a higher altitude or is in the process of re-entry, no abort method will be able to function. Really, there are very few cases where an abort system would be useful for Starship. Not just Starship, in the history of spaceflight, there are not many cases where the abort system actually saved lives. To date, an abort system has only been triggered in actual flight three times. The first occurrence took place during an uncrewed test flight of the Soyuz 7KOK No. 1 mission in 1966. At ignition, one of the strap-on boosters failed to ignite, prompting an automatic command that shut down both the core stage and the remaining boosters. Launch personnel then began preparations to remove the booster from the pad for inspection. However, about 27 minutes after the aborted launch, the launch escape system, LES, unexpectedly activated. The Soyuz descent module was ejected from the stack and made a safe landing about 400 meters from pad 31. Meanwhile, the LES exhaust ignited the third stage of the booster, 
sending flames curling down its side as launch personnel scrambled for cover. Moments later, the core stage and remaining strap-ons exploded, completely destroying the launch vehicle and causing significant damage to LC-31. Tragically, one person on the ground lost their life, and the pad remained out of service for seven months after the disaster. The abort system actually kills a person in this case. The next incident occurred on September 26, 1983, during the Soyuz T-10-1 mission, which was intended to dock with the Salyut 7 space station, already occupied by the Soyuz T-9 crew. However, the mission never completed its countdown. The launch vehicle was destroyed by a fire on the launch pad on that fateful day. Just six seconds before the explosion, the Soyuz spacecraft's launch escape system fired, ejecting the crew to safety. As of 2025, this remains the only instance in history where a launch escape system was activated before launch with a crew aboard. The most recent use of an abort system occurred during the Soyuz MS-10 mission in 2018, following a booster failure. A few minutes after liftoff at 0840 UTC, the crew reported experiencing weightlessness, and mission control confirmed a booster malfunction. The primary cause of the failure was a collision that occurred during the separation of the rocket's first and second stages. In response, a contingency was declared, and the spacecraft carrying the crew initiated an emergency separation. It then returned to Earth on a ballistic trajectory, during which the crew endured about six to seven times Earth's gravity. Despite the intense forces, the crew successfully landed. The abort occurred at an altitude of approximately 50 kilometers, with the spacecraft reaching an apogee of 93 kilometers before making a safe landing 19 minutes and 41 seconds after launch. Additionally, during the Mercury Redstone 1 mission on November 21, 1960, the escape system was unintentionally activated when the Redstone booster engine shut down shortly after ignition on the pad. As a result, the escape system blasted off from the Mercury spacecraft, but the spacecraft itself remained attached to the booster on the ground. While having an escape system is valuable for emergencies, if we can make the entire rocket safer, we may not need one at all. Adding a propulsion system to the rocket would only complicate things and introduce more potential issues. SpaceX is on the right path by working toward a fully reusable rocket which will allow us to gain crucial experience as the rocket flies more frequently. Soon, rockets could be as safe as commercial airplanes, 